<laughs> all right, I guess we'll get started. Um, thank you all for joining us today. This program was graciously funded by the South Dakota Humanities Council. Um, today we're going to learn about uh, how God has shaped South Dakota history with South Dakota Humanities Council scholar, Ern Floyd. We welcome her. Thank you, and be sure to check out the South Dakota Humanities website. They have a lot of speakers with a lot of wonderful programs and also um, the, the books, the speakers about books of the authors. So check out their website. <clears throat> so yes, we're gonna talk about how dogs have shaped South Dakota life. Dogs arrived in the Americas with the First Nations. Dogs were domesticated in Siberia, that says Eurasia, but also that's in the vicinity of Siberia about 26,000 years ago. So this shows that they were the first domesticated animal and I have a feeling they helped trap the other animals so that they could be domesticated too. <clears throat> So at that time, there were no horses on either North or South America, and the people had to travel by foot. And they, they uh, some scholars believe they crossed um, from Asia into North America uh, and that they brought their dogs with them and they used dog travois. And this is a, true size for a large dog, but it should have leather all the way up, but leather's expensive, so I kind of took a shortcut. <laughs> and this would, this part would actually rest up by the dog's shoulder blades, and then, so they carried the burden. <clears throat> And historians believe that. historians believe that there were probably around 300,000 dogs in North America before the Europeans arrived. So that was a lot of dogs, but they needed those dogs to help. And uh, we'll, we'll visit more about that. Um, in some First Nation cultures, archaeologists have discovered pottery-shaped dogs that have been buried with humans. So I found that very interesting that they chose, that was one of the animals they chose to make an effigy of. There's two more that they found. And th those were found in Mesoamerica, so Mexico and South, South America. So this brings us to the very early history of South Dakota. Specifically, I talk about southeastern South Dakota. Um, <clears throat> oh, and several First Nations believe dogs guide the, guide the human to the afterlife. And also they have found dogs buried in a curled up position. And they have found, archeologists have found food in pottery bowls for the dog in the afterlife. And those are found in the southeastern states of North America, the Ohio River Valley, and then west into Illinois. So we'll go forward to southeastern South Dakota. The Umaha or Omaha, the Ponca and the Bacoji or Iowa, Iowa or Iowa, settled in what is now southeastern South Dakota. And at this time, it's called Gooder State Park, and it extends into northwestern Iowa. And they would have traveled with dogs and dog travois because, again, there were no horses around until the Europeans arrived, Columbus and the Spanish, and, and after that. Um, I am a little bit Omaha, and I enjoyed learning that the creator gave the Omaha and Ponca three things after he created humans. 
he gave them corn, bows and arrows, and dogs. So I was quite tickled. Being a dog lover, I was tickled to find that out. Dogs help guard villages and to pull travois for hunting and for trade. Some First Nations, like you'll see in this picture, some First Nations let a dog sleep right inside the lodge or right inside the teepee. And the Navajo, the Navajo's word for dog translates to doorway protector. <laughs> so, and that's just what they do. <laughs> and then, in Southeast South Dakota, dogs helped an extensive trade system all across North America. The Omaha Ponca and Bakoji had a permanent village for over 200 years along the Big Sioux River for several miles. And they did, it was a massive trade site. And archeologists know this because Pipestone is found there. And that's found in, in Pipestone, Minnesota. The large unfinished piece is a raw piece of Pipestone and then the two carved ones are pipes. And archeologists know this because Pipestone is found throughout North America, finished Pipestone, carved Pipestone is found throughout North America. And then the next slide, the biggest one, the Darkest one is obsidian. The two smaller ones, ones are chert. Those minerals are not found in this area. So that tells archeologists that there was a lot of trade going on. And then just remember all that trade was going on on foot and with the aid of dogs pulling dog travelers. And they would have also traded bison hides, bison bones, skulls, uh, crops, corn, beans, squash. If another First Nation needed food, they would have come to a trade site and traded for food and then brought other products to trade back. Um, <clears throat> also, they planted gardens on the floodplain all along the Big Sioux River of corn, beans, squash, pumpkins, and sunflowers. And again, dog crab boys were used at harvest time. Again, that would have had more bison or deer hide on it. And you could have put all your harvested crops on that travoy and take it up the hill from the floodplain to where the lodges are, because the lodges were on the next highest hills. And if you visit Gooder State Park and know where to look, you might be able to find travoy ruts going up and down the hill. So I I worked there a few years and found that very interesting. So the gentleman back there found him it actually <laughs> in the blue shirt. <laughs> um, and then the Omaha Ponca bred three sizes of dogs, large dogs for pulling and for hunting, medium sized dogs for hunting and small dogs to guard the village. And in one book about Omaha women, one of the women says that the little dogs were chosen to guard the village because they were yippy. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this slide shows you the dogs were used to push prey animals into snares or into um, enclosed areas where the men could hunt easier. And they were also used to retrieve waterfowl and land birds, game birds. They also went out with the majority of the Omaha Ponca and Bakoji two times a year for a bison hunt in the spring and then either in the late fall or early winter. And the dogs went with them and they would have been pulling. When they went on their hunts, they've stayed in teepees. They put up teepees for lodging. So those dogs would have been pulling teepee poles, the hides, 
cooking vessels, food to take along to eat, like the dried pemmican. And then they also took a lot of empty travois along on dogs. And can anyone guess why they took empty travois along on a hunt? To bring back. What yeah, exactly. To bring back all the hides, to bring back all that meat. Um, even they even they used everything. So they would have brought back sinew, skulls, bones, shoulder shoulder blades for the the gardening tools. So they brought everything back on those empty dog trap boys. And then oh I I brought I I show this, this is a hammer or a maul, and it would have been taken along to pound in the teepee poles, the lodge poles. And those are what garden tools, those are the garden tools. And then the other thing I learned is each woman owned her lodge, each woman owned her gardening tools, and each woman owned the dogs. The men didn't own them. They ended up when horses came, the men owned the horses. The women owned the dogs. And then this, I found this interesting in reading about the Omaha Panga, the Koji. Each family had 20 to 40 dogs. So, but you, it makes sense after I thought about it, it makes sense. They need that many to pull that many travois to go on hunts and harvest the crops and, and just protecting the large village. So I found that really interesting. Um, here's a picture of a man who's made a whelping den for a dog to have puppies in. I don't know what, it didn't tell me what First Nations he belonged to though. Um, these are not associated with South Dakota, but I still found them interesting. A woman is resuscitating a choking dog, and then a drawing of a black bobtailed dog of a man named Wolf Chief. And then the third dog is the Hadatsa dog, and I guess they were spotted. Here's the woman with her, her dog, and you can see the dog Travoy behind the word Daddy in these. <laughs> but it's that Travoy's there. And then here's a woman with two of her dogs. And then I, these are alley children. And it was just too special to not put in there. But there they are showing off their sled dog puppies. And then we come to the colonial times. Again, dogs were used to herd, protect, and to hunt. The pioneers arrived and traveled with their dog or dogs, usually, and the dogs usually walked by the covered wagons. They also traveled with lots of oxen, cows, pigs, uh, chickens, as well as all of their belongings. And all of those animals, except the chickens, followed the wagons. So those dogs would have also come in handy to herd the animals up close to the wagons. And the, the chickens were, when they were traveling, the chickens were in wooden crates in the covered wagons. Then when they would stop and make a campsite, they would let the chickens get out and feed insects and grass, that type of thing. And here's a really good one showing that an artist has painted of all the animals following along. And of course the dogs would have helped hunt for food. <clears throat> now we come to, we go forward in time and we come to the Great Depression. And when I started researching for this program, I thought, ooh, I bet I'm going to find a lot of sad stories where dogs, they had to part with dogs. And I was surprised most of the people kept their dogs. And there again, 
it was to protect their property. Um, I know my, my grandmother was glad she kept their dog because people would come to the farm and try to steal chickens and eggs. And the dog would alert them. I remember as a little girl her telling me that, that the dog would bark and grandpa would get up and shoot people away. <laughs> Not shoot, 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 shoot them away. So, but yeah, um, they were very grateful to have the dog around because it alerted them. <clears throat> and then, um, that is my grandma. <laughs> and my mother. And that was during the Great Depression. And then um, this photo was taken taken in southeastern South Dakota. And this one was taken around just along the South Dakota Iowa border. And then the rest of the photos are not from South Dakota, but it shows just even during that time of poverty, people kept their dogs for companionship and for protection. I love the way he's looking at his dog. <laughs> And this one really strikes me too. You can see how poor they are and have not little mouths to feed, but they kept the dog again, I'm sure to guard and protect. And then we come to present day and it's very common now. We have dogs used for searching after a storm, after a building collapse, that type of thing. We have search and rescue dogs. And we have service dogs. Um, and we have therapy dogs now. And there you can find therapy dogs in schools, retirement centers, hospitals are even allowing dogs in. And then recent, recently it made the news that the Sioux Falls Police Department <coughs> purchased a golden retriever puppy and it's being trained to be a therapy dog, not um, not a police dog, a therapy dog, so that when they come back to the office, there's a dog there that they can talk to and pet and calm down. The, um, another use for dogs in South Dakota, especially West River, are herding dogs. They rely on herding breeds to drive their sheep, cattle, and goats, they also guard the livestock, especially in the vast West River pastures. And they also guard the people's homes. So I, the, the Border Collie is one of the most popular ones. And that is a Aussie. That's one of my coworkers' dogs. <laughs> Australian Shepherds are used a lot too in South Dakota. And then out in the West River, you'll find more Great Pyrenees. They're a bigger dog. A lot of the ranchers out there will have two dogs so they can work as a pack or a team. But those bigger dogs can fend off coyotes easier and their coat is perfect for being out there in the prairie. So you'll see a lot of a lot more out in West River. And then the South Dakota National Guard has dogs to sniff out explosives. And then in my research, I discovered the South Dakota Highway Patrol has 14 teams of officers and dogs and all 14 are Belgian Malinois. So I was surprised There's, they went with all Belgian Malinois. And they are trained in narcotics and explosive detection, tracking, aiding in apprehension and evidence recovery. And then some of the local law enforcement 
do use German Shepherds in the area. And then we come to the, not the most important, but the one that makes brings in the most money, and that's hunting. South Dakota is known for its, its hunting, and dogs help hunt. They retrieve waterfowl and land birds, and pheasant hunting brings in more than $220 million every year to South Dakota. So it's a, it's a really good money maker for the state. And so here we have a man out hunting with his two dogs, this one with his. And then Pheasants Forever researched the most popular hunting breeds in South Dakota in 2020 and 2021. And the most popular ones are the Labrador Retriever. So here's a black lab, a chocolate lab. And then, I oh, don't get confused. This is a German wire haired pointer. They have really grown in popularity. These are German, German short hair pointers. This is a wire hair pointing Griffon, and they're also growing in popularity. Um, we're at, I work at a vet clinic, and we board dogs, and there are times I cannot tell these from the other ones, the, the um, German wire hair pointer. They, they can look so much alike. This is a Brittany Spaniel, Vichlas, English Setters. This is a Springer Spaniel. You can, I'm, he's got a pheasant in his mouth. You can see the head right down, right down there. And then another coworker asked me for a favor, so. This is her Springer Spaniel, and he, as she said, his job is to be a companion dog. <laughs> this is a Weimar Runner and Golden Retriever. Those are the most popular hunting dogs in South Dakota. And then I did include a photo of an Irish Setter. They're not as popular, but they're very, very good at hunting. And actually, there's a few English Cocker Spaniels in South Dakota, especially East River. They're really very good at flushing out pheasants. They'll, they'll spook the pheasant up, and that's what they're known for is flushing out the game birds. And then I give another program program called Journey into the Past, and many, many people have told me, please do a program about dogs and how important they are to South Dakota and the public. So this is kind of what inspired, this is what inspired this program. This is Tundra, and the Travoy was made to fit him. So that soft part rested on his shoulder blades. And then you would have, a First Nation person could have filled up that travoy to haul stuff. And he's a Malamute. He was a Malamute mix. And then there's another one of him and me. So. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Is there a particular breed or breeds that um, are descended from the first dogs that were here in South Dakota? Um, I researched that on the internet. It's debatable. A lot of a lot of the native dogs. Did the little boy leave? Yes. Okay. Okay. A lot of the native dogs were killed off when the Spanish conquistadors arrived. 
they had a lot of like cane corso type, the Rottweilers, and they actually attacked all the dogs that they met along the way as the Spanish went up the river into South America and up through Mexico and up into the North America. So a lot of dogs disappeared that way. Um, you can Google it on the internet. There are some sites that claim that this dog is related to the First Nations dog, original dogs, or this breed is, but it, they're very, very rare. You mentioned that First Nations bred three different sizes, typically. The Omaha Ponca did. Omaha Ponca, excuse me. Thank you. Okay. Um, for the larger dogs, are we thinking, do we know if it was like German Shepherd size or it, larger? Yes, it was Malamute German Shepherd size. They, yes, they were that size. The medium, probably more like a Britney, Span, Britney Spaniel size are a little bit bigger. And then they bred some very small ones like the people in South America did much smaller. Yeah, the Yippers. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, see the Navajo word that they have for dogs means doorway protector. So yes, the little alarm. Any other question? I'm very grateful um, for your presentation. I'm very grateful that you mentioned the, the women. Yes. <laughs> That's one of the reasons We're... people would approach me after my journey into the past. It'd be like, do this program. <laughs> do this program. Because yes, I've actually had, I've given it to high school classrooms. <laughs> And there's even been some high school girls, when I say the women own the lodges, they own their gardening tools, they own their cooking utensils, and they own the dogs. There's been high school girls that will yell out, hooray, or yippee, or... <laughs> <laughs> well, and to know the women not only owned, but controlled that many, you said 20 to 40? 20, 20 to 40 dogs. And they could train and have control of and be the master of that many dogs at a time and Correct. have them do that kind of job. Correct. Is and amazing. Correct. Like, <laughs> that's, that's incredible. And yeah. that, that couple buffalo bird in that bull boat, I should have talked about that one more. She was a Rickara. And in her, she, she kept a diary what and wrote a they wrote a book interviewing her when puppies were born they would actually bless each puppy with sage mm -hmm. so yes the woman the the women had more ownership and control than what most people would expect but yes the puppies were blessed and you are right, they worked with them, they had their daughters work with them. And in fact, I, if I, if I give the program next year, I, he, I want him to build a smaller dog, dog travoy and strap it on to one of our Cocker Spaniel. <laughs> <laughs> because I can kind of see the young girls helping bring in the harvest, going on the hunt and helping. And they they might have taken some of those middle-sized dogs with a smaller travoy to fit fit their body height. So I think that'll be the <laughs> that'll have to be a project. <clears throat> Anybody else? Well, if you wouldn't, thank you, first of all. Thank, thank you, you for coming. Much. Thank you for coming. Um.
informed you before you leave if you wouldn't mind filling out a program evaluation for the South Bridge Managers Council. We have paper copies, otherwise there are QR codes posted and you show them for your smartphone. Yes, they need those reviews. So. Thank you. 